Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Hey guys, it's Cosmic Skeptic, and I asked my supporters on Patreon what content they'd like to see on the channel, and they voted for a video on the trial of Galileo. If you like what I do, by the way, please do consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar per month can go a really long way. Uh, or if you prefer to get something in return for your support of the channel, we're also now selling Cosmic Skeptic Christmas jumpers just in time for the holidays uh, if you want to engage in the festivities without the Christmas or religious imagery all over your clothing. Now, as you may already know, I'm currently reading for a degree in philosophy and theology. And as part of a science and religion module for the theology part, I had to spend some considerable time last term reading the works and personal correspondence of Galileo Galilei in order to find out what his trial and sentence at the hands of the Catholics can tell us about the relationship between the church and the scientific method. Galileo's story is one of the most misrepresented in the history of science and religion, so I just wanted to make a video like this, clearing some things up. So firstly, if you think that Galileo dared to suggest that the Earth orbits the Sun, not the other way around, and was tortured and killed by the Catholic Church for his audacity in doing such a thing, you'd be wrong. Galileo was never tortured, nor was he put to death, and stories of his persecution have historically been greatly exaggerated. However, Galileo was legally condemned by the Church for trying to write about the heliocentric model, and not only this, but in such a way that may have involved some fraud on the part of the Catholic authorities. There's a lot to unpack here, but I want to be comprehensive, so strap yourselves in and use the time codes in the pinned comment if you want to skip to any particular section. Part 1. Context. The first thing to understand about the trial of Galileo is the context in which it occurred. Galileo lived in the 16th and 17th centuries, meaning that he was born right after the Protestant Revolution, in which the Catholic Church, of course, experienced an unprecedented challenge to its authority, and as well as this, a loss of followers. In response to the Protestant Revolution, the Church called the Council of Trent, an ecumenical council wherein Church authorities all came together in order to clarify the position of the Catholics and to denounce the heresies of Protestantism. Most relevant to our present discussion is that in Session 4 of the Council of Trent, the Catholics explicitly limited the interpretation of the Bible to bishops and councils of the Church, meaning that only they could decide what the Bible really meant and how to interpret its messages. If anybody else, such as, I don't know, an individual Italian scientist, for example, attempted to reinterpret scripture, they would therefore be breaking this rule established by the Council of Trent. They did this, of course, because the entire Protestant Revolution was kick-started by precisely that, an individual man reinterpreting scripture and arguing that the official Catholic interpretation was wrong. Now here's where the trouble starts brewing. See, Galileo championed a heliocentric model of the solar system, previously advanced by Copernicus, holding that the Earth moves orbiting around the Sun, which is at the center of the system. Helio referring to Sun, giving us heliocentrism. But the official understanding of the Church at the time was that the Earth is at the center of the universe instead, and doesn't move at all. So did Galileo reject Holy Scripture? Well, no, he didn't. One thing Galileo consistently argued throughout his writing is that God's word is always correct and trustworthy. But he also argued that, being inerrant, Scripture cannot contradict what is true in nature. Both must be true. So, putting this together, since Galileo believed that the Earth orbits the Sun, and that our interpretation of Scripture must therefore reflect this, but the Church's official interpretation of Scripture is that the Earth doesn't orbit the Sun, this essentially equates to Galileo reinterpreting Scripture and saying that the Church's interpretation is wrong. But as I mentioned before, the Council of Trent had forbidden any individual from doing this kind of scriptural reinterpretation, so Galileo had broken the rules. Part 2. Galileo's Justification Galileo's defense of his right to reinterpret Scripture based on his observations and heliocentrism is comprehensively covered in a letter that he wrote to the Grand Duchess Christina of Tuscany in 1615. Throughout this letter, Galileo repeatedly defends the compatibility of religion and science, and doesn't criticize scripture in any way, but he bravely holds to the idea that if science tells us something is true about the natural world, it is completely unreasonable for the church to expect the scientist to ignore what they've discovered and blindly trust the approved interpretation of scripture instead. Galileo argues continually that scripture cannot be false, and we would be foolish to attempt to disprove it. 
but also argues that nature cannot be false either. And so if our observations of nature contradict our interpretation of scripture, our interpretation must be wrong. Here's a quote from his letter, so you can have it in his own words. It is necessary for the Bible, in order to be accommodated to the understanding of every man, to speak many things which may appear to differ from the absolute truth so far as the bare meaning of the words is concerned. This is Galileo saying that sometimes, to help our understanding, the Bible doesn't speak literally, but instead employs metaphors and analogies. Galileo continues, But nature, on the other hand, is inexorable and immutable. She never transgresses the laws imposed upon her, or cares a whit whether her abstruse reasons and methods of operations are understandable to men. The implication of this, of course, is that whilst the Bible may often be speaking in terms that aren't literally true, and so can feasibly be reinterpreted, nature never uses metaphors. And so when the two contradict, we know which one we must have misunderstood. And Galileo writes that there is no way a scientist, in the face of evidence that seems to clearly contradict the Bible, could simply dismiss the evidence for that reason. Here it is again in his own words. Again, to command that the very professors of astronomy themselves see to the refutation of their own observations and proofs as mere fallacies and sophisms is to enjoin something that lies beyond any possibility of accomplishment. For this would amount to commanding that they must not see what they see, and must not understand what they know, and that in searching they must find the opposite of what they actually encounter. We simply can't expect someone not to reinterpret scripture if the current interpretation says that the Earth is at the center of the solar system and we discover evidence to the contrary. But this is the heresy that Galileo committed, daring to suggest that we should rethink our understanding of the world. Part three, Galileo's warning. In 1616, Pope Paul V, in an official decree, formally declared heliocentrism as heretical due to it being, quote, false and completely contrary to the divine scriptures. Copernicus's book on heliocentrism was subsequently banned until corrections were made to it, such as the removal of suggestions that the earth moves, again because this contradicted the church's understanding of scripture. Here we need to introduce a new person into the story. Cardinal Robert Bellarmine was one of the most important counter-revolutionary figures in the Catholic Church in the time of Galileo, and in 1616, a year after Galileo's letter to the Grand Duchess Christina, and just one month before the official decree we just mentioned was issued by the church, was the man chosen by the Pope to go and speak to Galileo about the heliocentric views that Galileo had been defending. Bellarmine was sent to inform Galileo about the forthcoming decree, which would officially label Galileo's views as heretical. And what happened at this meeting, specifically what Cardinal Bellarmine told Galileo, is the most crucial element of the entire Galileo affair, but is also shrouded in mystery and controversy. The Catholic Church contends that during their meeting, Bellarmine ordered Galileo on the authority of the Church not to write or teach about heliocentrism in any way, shape, or form. But as we'll see, that might well not have been what was actually said. What we do know for certain is that Cardinal Bellarmine, visiting Galileo, told him on behalf of the Church that heliocentrism is incorrect and, philosophically speaking, quote, cannot be defended or held. The reason these words spoken to Galileo are of such vital importance is that the contents of this meeting between Cardinal Bellarmine and Galileo were the basis for Galileo's later trial and sentencing. The charges brought against Galileo in his trial were based on the orders that Cardinal Bellarmine supposedly delivered to Galileo in this meeting. But as we'll see, the church might have gotten what the cardinal actually said wrong, or maybe even purposefully misrepresented what he said to Galileo in order to silence the scientist. Part four, the dialogue. As I say, this alleged warning to Galileo against writing about heliocentrism happened in 1616, which was some time before Galileo's trial. Fast forwarding seven years, in 1623, one of Galileo's personal acquaintances was elected as Pope Urban VIII. And so Galileo went to visit his friend, the new Pope, in Rome. And it's said that when he did, the Pope loosened the church's censure of heliocentrism, suggesting that Galileo may have permission to write about it, in fact, provided he did so in a hypothetical manner. 
It's worth bearing in mind, however, that the Pope was unaware of the orders that Cardinal Bellarmine had supposedly delivered to Galileo back in 1616. So now we move to 1632, which is the year in which Galileo published his book, his Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. It's this book that kick-started his eventual trial. These two systems he mentions in the book's title are the Ptolemaic geocentric view, with the Earth at the center of the system, and the Copernican heliocentric view, with the Sun at the center. Now, in accordance with the advice of Pope Urban that he'd been given, Galileo wrote his book in the form of a dialogue between fictional characters, each one defending different models of the solar system. Now, this fictional approach and the fact that both sides were argued would, presumably, Galileo thought, make the discussion a hypothetical one, just as the Pope had recommended. Not so, said Galileo's critics, many of whom thought that the arguments presented by the character Salviati, who was the one defending heliocentrism, were just a little bit too strong, clearly winning the argument and suggesting that this character's views were in fact the ones being advocated by the author. Whatever be the case, Galileo had written a powerful, if hypothetical and fictional, defense of the heliocentric model, which, surprise, surprise, didn't go down too well with the church. Part five, the trial. Galileo's book angered his old friend, the Pope, who subsequently ordered a commission to investigate Galileo, resulting in him finally being put on trial in 1633. And this commission discovered something interesting as proof against Galileo. Remember, the charge against Galileo was this. Supposedly, according to the church, he had been ordered way back in 1616 by Cardinal Bellarmine not to talk or write about heliocentrism in any way whatsoever. And here he was writing a book clearly contradicting that injunction. Now, in order to prove that Galileo had been explicitly told not to do this, that he had been ordered not to write about it, the prosecutors, the Pope's commission, produced a copy of a letter that they discovered in the files of the Holy Office that Cardinal Bellarmine had apparently written to Galileo just after the two met, recounting what had been said at the meeting. In this letter from Cardinal Bellarmine, Galileo was told, quote, henceforth not to hold, teach, or defend it, it being heliocentrism, in any way whatever, either orally or in writing, otherwise the Holy Office would start proceedings against him. This does seem pretty damning. Here is a copy of a letter written by Cardinal Bellarmine explicitly recounting that Galileo had been told not to teach about heliocentrism, quote, in any way whatever, and that if he did, he would be legally prosecuted. Clearly, Galileo broke this injunction by writing his dialogue, and so it seems that the church was justified in punishing him, right? Well, buckle up. Here's where things get really interesting. In the most dramatic part of the entire trial, get this, Galileo produced his own version of the same letter, but not only that, Galileo's letter was the original letter, which the prosecution didn't know he had. Galileo's version of the letter was written in Bellarmine's own hand and signed by the cardinal, neither of which were true about the church's version of the letter. In other words, the Holy Office presented a copy of a letter to condemn Galileo, but Galileo had the original, and the prosecutors didn't know this until he produced it during the trial. But so what, right? The church's letter was just a copy of the original, so who cares if Galileo was in possession of the first version? Well, mysteriously, one might even say suspiciously, Galileo's version of the letter doesn't say that Galileo was ordered not to talk or write about heliocentrism in any way whatever. Instead, it just tells him that heliocentrism is wrong and shouldn't be explicitly advocated. And since Galileo's book was a work of fictional dialogue, this would mean he never actually broke any of the church's commands. Galileo's original letter was missing the crucial order upon which his entire trial was predicated. How very strange. I mean, okay, let me be clear here. Let me just briefly sum up this picture for you. The church, in its inerrant and infinite wisdom, declares heliocentrism to be heretical. They visit Galileo and later put him on trial for breaking an order he was apparently given in 1616, but the letter they used to prove that he'd been given this order was only a copy, and Galileo produces the original letter, which, mysteriously, doesn't mention the order at all. Okay, so what are we to make of this? Why might the church be in possession of a copy of a letter with a suspicious addition, not in the original, 
that just so happens to support their case against Galileo. Was this all just a big coincidental happy accident for the church? Now, some scholars have rudely suggested that the church faked their version of the letter in order to bring down Galileo, but I mean, they'd surely never do something as evil and dishonest as that, would they? Well, I'll leave it to your own consideration, dear viewer, now that you know the facts. Part 6. The Sentence So, finally, a verdict was reached. The church had their letter, Galileo had his, and since Galileo's was clearly the more trustworthy account, the church admitted their mistake, let Galileo go free, and they all lived happily ever after, except of course they didn't, don't be ridiculous. Instead, the church gave precedence to their own version of the letter, found Galileo, quote, vehemently suspected of heresy, banned his book by public edict, and sentenced him to, quote, formal imprisonment in this holy office at our pleasure. Now, as it happens, this formal imprisonment ended up amounting to what we would today call house arrest. Galileo spent most of the remainder of his life in his Italian villa. So after the trial, Galileo didn't suffer in any prison cell. But his physical and intellectual freedom certainly suffered from the prison of religious dogmatism until the day he died. Galileo was forced to recant his heliocentric views and never wrote about them again. So Galileo was never tortured, nor was he put to death for his views, and the punishment he received was actually relatively mild. But now that you know the story of Galileo's trial, it's up to you to decide whether you think even a minimal punishment was justified at all. Remember, Galileo was charged with breaking an order that he may well have never actually received, and proof of which may have been forged by the church. This is, of course, scandalous, but don't let it distract you from the fact that even if Galileo did actually receive that order, even if the church wasn't lying or faking anything, the order was still an unjust one, and so his punishment would still have been unjust too. Remember, the order itself was to stop talking about heliocentrism, a scientific truth we now know to be undeniably accurate, simply because it contradicted scripture. So even if the church really did order Galileo in 1616 not to talk about it, they had no right to, and it only makes Galileo all the more brave for continuing to champion the scientific method despite the unimaginable risk. Conclusion Now, for the sake of fairness, here's one potential argument in defense of the actions of the church, which I actually see a lot of Catholic historians make. In Galileo's day, let's not forget, heliocentrism was far from established. Right? Galileo never actually proved that it was true, nor had anybody done so, not conclusively anyway. At the time, it was still a mere hypothesis. Not only this, but Cardinal Bellarmine himself actually once said that if unequivocal proof was presented to support heliocentrism, the church would reinterpret the scriptures. So it's not that Galileo was silenced because he was a threat, but because he couldn't actually prove what he was arguing, and so the church wasn't anti-science because heliocentrism wasn't science yet. Now I could answer this objection by imploring you to go and just simply read the actual sentence administered by the church to Galileo in 1633, a link to which is in the description. It's palpably clear that the church wasn't just saying that Galileo's views hadn't been proven, but that they were false, and that this is why Galileo was condemned. Here in the words of the church itself, taken from its sentencing of Galileo, is my case in point. We say, pronounce, sentence, and declare that you, the above-mentioned Galileo, because of the things deduced in the trial and confessed by you as above, have rendered yourself, according to this holy office, vehemently suspected of heresy, namely, of having held and believed a doctrine which is false and contrary to the divine and holy scripture, that the sun is the center of the world and does not move from east to west, and the earth moves and is not the center of the world, and that one may hold and defend as probable an opinion after it has been declared and defined contrary to Holy Scripture. Is there any doubt about what this trial was really about? But despite this, let's just grant for a minute that the trial really was about Galileo's method and decorum, rather than his actual beliefs. Here's where we need to remember something crucially important about what science actually is. Science, it pays to remind ourselves, is not a thing as such, but a method. Right? It's a way of understanding the world, not a list of facts or truths. Science is a method characterized by open inquiry, the ability and willingness to question established beliefs about the universe, and to hypothesize about potential alternative explanations. And so even if Galileo couldn't conclusively prove the heliocentric model that he advocated, 
The process of discussion and debate that books like his dialogue represented define and are absolutely crucial to the scientific method. It's this, the, the challenge, the inquiry, the questioning, that the church attempted to silence in Galileo. This is why the accusation that the church was in conflict with science is a justified one. Not because they tried to silence a fact, but because they tried to prevent the honest method of obtaining facts, fearing that they would contradict scripture. Not because the church held to the wrong view, but because they did so dogmatically, without allowing any challenges. This is why Galileo is called the father of the scientific method, because he realized that despite what any divinely inspired authorities might tell us, the essence of truth lies in trusting what we prove and observe, not what we're told. I've been Alex O'Connor, or Cosmic Skeptic. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon to allow me to continue making videos and to vote on what kind of content you'd like to see from me in the future. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell, as well as leaving a like and a comment. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.